So, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Taylor. Uh, I took over this, as the chair of uh, the Community Foundation at the beginning of this year. Uh, and for those that do know me, and there are some in the room, I probably bored you already for the last six months about why you need to get involved with the Community Foundation, because it's a fabulous uh, organisation and setup. And at least for a little time now, I've got you as a captive audience. <laughs> the sun has come out, and you're going to think about bubbles and food in a minute. So I'll try and be reasonably brief. Not always good for me. Uh, I have three topics I want to cover. The first one, and we've already done a bit of that on our journey, is just to look back a little bit at the history of community foundations. The second one is to very much look forward and just touch base on... Uh, our new strategy, OCF 2020. <coughs> and the third one, and that links back to the conversations already had, is to invite you to discuss and think about ways that we can bring the locally based trust and foundations more closely together to collaborate to meet our vision, which is to create a better life for everyone in Oxfordshire. So for the historians around, we all now know community foundations link local philanthropists with local causes. When was the first one formed? You had to wait at work and that keeps you awake. <laughs> and where was it formed? Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio in 1915 by Fred Goff. I gather an inspirational man. So that's where it started. How many foundations are there in the world today? 1800. 1800. Gosh, someone's doing the work. Right, now. Another one. Right, now. Uh, I thought we're not going to get into Brexit or anything, but how many are there in Germany? 350. 350, there you are. How many in the UK? 48. You're doing well. Right, now, okay. What's the total? Well, okay, that's a bit technical, whether they're still part of UKCF or not. Jane and I had a debate, all our literature says 48, but that's a cycle. <laughs> so we're sticking with that at the moment, I'm debate dominant. Um, what's the size of the endowment, if you look at all of those 48 in the UK added together? Not enough, 5 million, 500 million. It's not enough, but it's 500 million. And how much in terms of grants did they give out last year? 65 million. Uh, that ranks us about number four in the UK, but I think it gives us, because nobody knows about community foundations, do they? No, we're an unsung hero. We've got to do an awful lot more out there. In the UK, Swindon was the first one formed in 1975. Uh, Oxfordshire was part of a cohort, including uh, Heart of England, formed uh, in 1995. We've already heard from uh, Tim about some of the individuals that were involved in that. And it's a delight to have you here today. So I won't go too much into history because I met Liz Grieghaus reading minutes to me. She came in about what was said in here, there and everywhere. So if you want to learn about the history, go and talk to Liz. She's got it all over there. But I do understand as I've come in that the foundation... Uh, at the time of the financial recession, 2008-09, was in a pretty difficult financial position. Uh, even talk of going under. Uh, but fortunately for all of us here today, the group of trustees led by Anna Moon, as the then chair, took on the challenge and said, no, we're going to keep OCF going. So thank you for all of you that put that energy in there. A key move you made, actually, was, her, was hiring Jane here. Uh, she's our forever energetic and committed CEO, who's really made a difference. I think we're all very grateful for all of the work she's put in and continues to put in. Uh, and out of that, we've been able to uh, raise the endowment over the last five years by about 300%. So we've gone from 1.4 up to 4.2 million. But we talk about Wiltshire. I like a bit of benchmarking. I'm not a competitive fellow, but I like looking across at others. Wiltshire's got about the same population as Oxfordshire. Do you know how big their uh, endowment is today? 20 million. 20 million. And they're aspiring to get to 32. We would just like to get to at least 10 million by 2020. But I hope we'll do an awful lot more. But over those 21 years, OCF has awarded... 5 million in grants to around about 
1,200 charities, so a fair spread, which gives us a lot of knowledge about what's going on in the county. But over the last couple of years, that number's now gone up to about £700,000 a year that we're currently giving out. So I think when I look at the journey, uh, I think we've got some tremendous strengths to really build on, and that's really what we've set out to do. And that brings me neatly to my second topic, which is now looking forward. Where do we want to go as the community foundation? Uh, over the back end of last year and into the early part of this year, we've looked again at our strategy. Uh, we've worked with trustees and many others together to pull something together. And basically, our new strategy is formulated around two prongs. The first prong is to inspire local philanthropy. The second one is to develop what we call community-based solutions to the key social problems. And Dominic, we might not be able to get back to the Victorian times, but I think we need to get a lot more community ownership and bringing these things forward. So those are our two prongs of our strategy. But if you talk about understanding the problems, one of the things that I've learned very quickly is that we have insufficient knowledge about what's going on in the county in our sector, the social problems of what is there. And coming from a business background, uh, I feel how can you be successful if you don't know anything about the marketplace? You have to understand the market and what's going on there. And so to do that, uh, we uh, committed, I guess, Jane, it started towards the back end of last year, a piece of work, <laughs> and that is called Oxfordshire Uncovered. Well, today, Oxfordshire Uncovered is being uncovered. <laughs> this is now the official launch day of Oxfordshire Uncovered. And this will give you, when you leave today, as well, if, if you come to a birthday party, you get a surprise, you get a present. <laughs> well, you're going to have to wait until you leave to pick up your present. But I'm not going to say anything more about it. Just ask Jane just to say a couple of words about Oxfordshire Uncovered. Jane, please. Hi, I'm Jane. I'm coming back. <laughs> now, I'm very conscious that we all want to have a drink, so I am not going to talk for very long. And if I do, we have something in the office which we call the naughty step, and I know that I will be put on it. So, I'm, all I'm going to talk about is Oxtra Uncovered. Why have we called it Oxtra Uncovered? I don't know if any of you saw the massive stand there. Perhaps you couldn't miss it. Um, but we are launching something. So... There were loads and loads of statistics, and all of the, those statistics have actually come from this research. And I think we can sum up the research in four simple words. And, and John has already touched on it, but I'm going to say them. Oxfordshire has real inequality. And that is really what we wanted to uncover. And I think it's really easy for us to be here today and actually to forget that in this county there are so many people who are not as fortunate as us. And I know the team, and this is a real team effort, this is not my glory moment. I've had very little to do with Uncovered because there's some people in the audience, the team, we have used lots of research. It isn't stuff that we've gone out and done ourselves. We've pulled together information. We've spoken to loads of people and we've heard real stories of lives of people that are going unheard and unseen Many of the 200 people that Richard was talking to you about, people that just don't get a voice. And I can tell you, it's been a roller coaster of emotions in the office, and that is actually what we think people need to know about. And it, it just seems to us that people don't know about it. Um, here we are in Banbury, and this most wonderful parkland setting, yet just three miles or so down the road, there are three of the worst wards in the whole county. There's three out of 15 in the county of Oxfordshire are actually in the worst 20% in the whole country. Now, do you find that shocking that here you are in a green, wonderful space? I mean, that is something that we find really bad. So, as I said, I haven't got a lot of time. So I've just picked a few of the things that are actually on the stand. And over lunch, you can ask any one of us and we'll be able to tell you loads more. Um, now, it won't come as a surprise that 39% of the population actually live in rural areas. We are a very green county, and that is just natural. Most people live in settlements of less than £10,000. But the reality of this life is actually that 30% of those rural households are more than an hour away from a hospital. 
And if you sum that up, that 40% of pensioner households, and we know that nearly one in six of us in the county is actually over 65, actually don't have a car. It's not a good place to get it. Um, I was at an economic question time last week, and um, many of the businesses there were bemoaning the fact that they couldn't recruit staff. And there was a big debate ensued about housing. Well, it came as no surprise to me, and I did, I did pose a question from the floor, that Oxford is actually the most unaffordable place to live in the whole of this country. And that is a problem that has loads of consequences for us all. Yes, it's great if we all own a property, but the knock-on effects of having a housing crisis that we have in this county means that it's not just the person that you see sleeping rough when you're walking through the city centre. It's at all the village people protesting against planning permissions that they don't want happening in their village. So these things happen to us all but we have to do something about it. And I think that's why it was brilliant that Sir Dominic came today, because it isn't a problem that's just <coughs> happened. We have always had housing crisis, if you look back over the history of time, and I think we need to be thinking more as a community how we can we solve that. Um, the last point that I'm going to share is obviously Oxfordshire is an incredibly academic and world-class leading educational county. We have two great universities, lots of fantastic schools. But I think the thing that really, really we find so difficult is that not all children are able to access that wonderful thing that we can offer. Because we believe there's actually 12,000 unidentified young carers. Some of them as young as five, helping parents or siblings with medication. Many of them, 40% of them, have got special educational needs. And <coughs> for us, what that really means, that's 12,000 young children whose childhoods are being sacrificed, who actually, more than often, don't even get the opportunity to go to school because it's just absolutely <laughs> inconvenient. So we think that that is a tragedy. And this whole idea of young people and children, it's actually, as Richard mentioned it, mental health. We believe that in the 14 to 17 year olds, self-harming has become a real prevalent problem. So that is nearly two in every classroom, and it's boys and girls are actually doing something because they find life so difficult that they're trying to end their own lives. This cannot be right, and this cannot be right here in this wonderful setting in Oxfordshire that this is actually happening now. So that is our Oxfordshire Uncovered. It's a fantastic read. It really is. It's easy to read. Um, Thames Valley Police have helped us with it. Uh, the County Council helps with it. We've just pulled together favours from all our friends and our networks, and we believe we're giving you what uh, Andy Boyd says is a reality check. It is actually the Oxfordshire that Thames Valley Police recognise. So I would tell you, please over lunch, ask us a question. Um, but I think John has alluded to it. What was really behind us wanting to share this report? It's because we believe, as Sir Domic said, these problems are not going to go away, and they're bigger than all of us. And what we really hope is that this will enable people to want to come and work with us, to partner with us, to find ways of supporting charities like Richard in a very simple way. Let's not make it difficult. Let's not all be competitive, but let's find a way to do it together. Um, so thank you for coming. It's absolutely fabulous to see you all here, and the sun was shining, so I'm going to hand back to John. <laughs> You'll have a chance to read this on the way home or when you get back home. It is on the website. Uh, you can download it, but I actually think in, a, in this cover and the way they've done it, it's a great place to have it as a book. So we have lots and lots. We have books, boxes galore of them in the office. So <laughs> let us know if you'd like some. You're all very welcome to use them in conversations. Now just a couple of seconds on our, the other prong or the main prong of our strategy really inspiring local philanthropy. We got lots of ideas there, but I decided not to share those with you. They're for another day. I thought it was far better to actually ask somebody who has very recently created a, uh, a fund in our foundation just to share with you a few of his experiences. So I'm going to ask Mark Beard just to, again, very briefly say, what has it been like, Mark, and, and where do you see us? Thank you very much.
I will be very brief because I think I'm the one who's responsible for starting late. Um, just say, about six months ago, we looked to set up our own charitable foundation and wanting to give something back to the community in which we take our resources from. Um, looked at potentially setting up a charitable foundation of our own charitable number and found the governance that went with that more than we ideally wanted to take on the place. Um, and we looked at options and Jane came riding in with a solution or two for us. And for a small fee to be a partner of Oxford Community Foundation um, felt a very good solution for a number of reasons. One was we got away with all that governance that we didn't want because Jane was going to do it for us. <laughs> um, secondly, that it actually meant that we were part of something larger. Um, reciprocate Oxford Community Foundation. It was a number of charities working together and we felt there was strength in that. So having delved a little bit further into what Oxford Community Foundation was about, we met John <coughs> and John provided us similar reassurance. And then we looked at the trustees of Oxford, Oxfordshire Community Foundation and that reinforced our desire to work together and also trust for the long term. And I suppose the one thing that really um, finalised it for me was it's Oxford, that trustees will come and go, but over the long term that Oxford is always going to generate that quality of governance that we could feel safe and confident <coughs> that our money is the right place. Um, so we hope to work with you over the long term, we hope to build up our foundation, um, we hope to do good within the communities we work, not just Oxford, but Bristol, Guildford and Swindon as well. Um, but most of all, we hope to have some fun because I think you're a great lot and you deserve all the all that you've achieved. Well done for what you've achieved and also the next 21 years. Thanks Mark very much. Uh, and let's hope we have many more inspirational talks from other groups that come and join us. <coughs> so my final topic then, if you can remember, it was about an invitation in that we have a number of you that represent uh, local trusts and foundations. And if you can manage it, I've just got six questions for you. Are you ready for them? There's a test to see whether you remember them at the end. <laughs> Firstly, do you believe you are making full impact you desire? Secondly, are there other organisations who might add to your particular strengths, in very much in the way that Dominic was alluding to? Thirdly, are we collectively, as the Trust and Foundations, requiring charities to spend an excessive amount of time in completing grant application forms, as Richard has <laughs> described? I wrote that before I listened to you. <laughs> Fourthly, could we share evaluations and grant assessment visits so collectively our efforts might really enable a far better evaluation of the funds and where the money is being distributed to? Is there a smarter way of us all working together? And how can we really finally collaborate to inspire local philanthropy? This is very much part of our journey and as the foundation uh, we really want to see what we can do to try and work together in a far more collaborative way. We've shared this idea already with a number of trusts and foundations and we've been really very positively uh, encouraged by the feedback that we've had and we've already decided we would like to set up a funders forum to bring people together and if you want to put a date in your diary it's the 13th of October but more importantly if you'd like to be involved and have some discussions with us, uh, please then do get in contact with Jane. And again, to give you just a real feel of what's happening, I've asked uh, uh, Rupert Shepherd from St Michael's and All Saints Charities, who we've already had a couple of words with, just to share where they are with the journey. Uh, fondly known as Fifi's, which I've just learned out is trustees in ancient language. So very quickly, Rupert, if you give us a couple of words, then I'll wrap up and then we go off and celebrate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. Nobody has uh, convincingly explained to me how 
the word Fefes is pronounced. <laughs> we do have most. I represent uh, St. Michael's and All Saints Charities. We are a very ancient charity. We have historical uh, roots going back to medieval times. Uh, and we give out grants, about 120, 130 grants a year, to local charities, charities that are providing for people in need in Oxfordshire. We don't support social clubs, we don't support museums buying pictures and all of that kind. It's need that we go for, and we do support a very wide variety of local charities, uh, homeless, education, health, community groups, bereavement charities, all sorts, a very wide range. And we give out about 400, between 400 and 500,000 pounds a year in, in, in grants. My work and that of, um, I'm, I'm the clerk to the, to the, to the, to the fair fees, uh, and my, uh, part of my work and that of my assistant Joanna Steele, who's here, is to visit charities. This is as a follow-up after grants have been awarded. And it's very rare indeed that we don't return from these visits thoroughly enthused uh, and full of admiration for the um, focus and commitment of these charities that are very much at the, at the cutting edge of uh, meeting the needs of people with, 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 with in, in very deprived situations. When we visit, we, we try and structure our questions without being too formal, and we then return to our trustees with uh, written reports, which are quite detailed. Um, and it's a fact that these reports have had an impact on their grant awarding policies. So, for example, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that we often hear is that charities find it much easier to raise funds for specific projects. If they've got a specific project, grant awarding charities are much more likely to be sympathetic than if they go and say, well, actually, we've got real problems meeting our core costs, but without <coughs> meeting our core costs, we can't really function efficiently. And so we are very open to uh, uh, funding core costs. And moreover, another change that's been made as a result of this, instead of just giving one-off grants, which we've been doing for many, many years, uh, we are now uh, receiving applications, encouraging applications for grants over a period, for three years. So that there's some certainty in, in uh, charities can have some certainty when they are funding, say, staff costs or, or whatever it might be, there are continuing costs over a period. Um, well, we're aware, though, that when we make these visits, charities are trying to paint a picture for our benefit to make us more favourable to future grant applications, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But Joanna and I often return from these meetings and we feel perhaps the lack of information on the context and the perspectives and environment in which these charities are operating, and we feel quite um, a need for a deeper understanding and we've already started the process of, of trying to understand for example the needs of homeless charities because that's uh, a particular area where there are considerable difficulties at the moment and um, uh, an area where which is particularly vulnerable to, to, to the pressures to which the voluntary sector um, is um, subject at the moment with the government cuts and so forth. So it occurred to us that um, there would almost certainly be benefits from greater contacts between grant awarding charities. And um, as a result of a very uh, positive meeting we had very recently with, with Jane and Marion, um, it seemed sensible to explore what grant awarding charities had in common, uh, learning from each other about, our, for example, our grant awarding processes. Uh, and exchanging information and expertise and insights into uh, what charities are trying to do and the environment in which they are operating. And it's wonderful to have had such a very positive response to, to, to these suggestions. So I hope very much, I mean, our, my, our charities have tended to operate very much on their own over the years, but I hope that we will have stronger links with other uh, grant awarding charities and, and especially of course uh, from the Oxford Community Foundation uh, and we very much look forward to strengthening our links and uh, thank you very much for, for, for arranging today a wonderful occasion and many congratulations on your first 21 years. <laughs> <laughs>
if there are others in the audience, or if you actually know other trusts and foundations you think might like to just come together and start to have a conversation, we'd love to have it. So uh, that's very much an invitation out there. Let's just see if by just talking and discussing what we can evolve to do together mm -hmm. to really help those that are suffering and not enjoying the stereotype of where we are. So basically on that, I'd like to draw this part of uh, uh, this morning, or I guess we're into this afternoon, to a close. I think it's time to now celebrate, uh, get the courts popping, and have some discussions. I guess uh, we celebrate here.